Hey everybody, we just got back from fishing the MLF Toyota series as a co-angler on Big Lake Sam Rayburn. And let me tell you, there's a lot of lessons learned uh, from this adventure down there. I want to go over some of those lessons learned here in this video. Y'all stay tuned. All right, so some of the lessons learned down at Sam Rayburn, MLF Toyota series. Uh, but let me just first start by saying, number one, I haven't been down that lake in 10, 10 years or better. And number two, I way over complicated things. Number three, hats off to Wyatt Ferguson and Brian Robinson. Those are the two pros I got to fish with. Wyatt ended up second place overall. Bright, young, talented man. He was a guide on that lake. Uh, I can really stick them. Doesn't matter which lake uh, that he fishes. Uh, he, he knows what he's doing. He can run that forge, uh, face the sonar like nobody's business. Hats off to him. Brian Robinson uh, is an ex NFL Minnesota Viking, defensive end, who graduated and played at the University of Texas and uh, played, I think, 11 years in the pros. And uh, uh, they both were very professional good individuals and uh, let me do what I needed to do uh, but more importantly they just show me some stuff that I'd never seen before and uh, again I way over complicated things so hats off to those guys for taking me fishing and uh, letting me ride in their boats I greatly appreciate the opportunity to get to know you and uh, look forward to seeing you and talking to you as this trail continues throughout the year now how did I over complicate things y'all stay tuned now, again, I had not fished Lake Sam Rayburn in 10 years or better, but I knew better because I have fished that lake. And being late January, I kind of knew what I needed to bring, but again, I didn't know. And your pros are not really obligated to tell you anything. And at the most part or at the highest level, you're typically fishing some kind of grass pattern, supposedly, right? Well, question number one is, what grass are you fishing? How deep is it? How skinny is it? Most of them won't tell you that. Number two, which part of the lake are we fishing? Most of them ain't gonna tell you that neither. Number three, what baits should I bring with me as a co-angler and what rods should I bring with me? Again, they're not gonna tell you any of that mess neither. But, dummy me here, said, eh, I'll just bring a little bit of everything in the RV and then I'll dumb it down when I get there. Well, folks, look, I'm gonna show you, <laughs> look at all of this stuff. Two tackle bags, several boxes, more boxes, all of baits. That's way over complicating things. And I brought eight rods. For crying out loud that might have been a little bit too much but we're going to go over some of this uh, in detail so y'all stay tuned here so to give you a little bit of the story here real quick uh, a nasty and I mean a nasty cold front blew through Tuesday uh, into Wednesday and it was so windy and so cold they canceled the first day. Uh, that wind was constant 40 miles an hour out of the northwest and on that lake that's just unsafe. So I, I give props to MLF and the tournament director there for uh, keeping us all safe uh, but at the end of the day we lost a day out of a three-day event um, to fish Lake Sam River on MLF. But hats off to them to make it a wise choice. Second day it was still cold. We put the boat in, dropped her in the drink, and it was 28 degrees. 28 degrees. And so, uh, as you might can imagine, you got to stay warm. All of you have seen my ice fishing suits from Striker Ice. I'm not sponsored by them in any shape, form, or fashion. But I tell you what, that ice suit did the job. I was not cold. Uh, the wind, um, just the cold temperatures, I was not cold. 
The other part about that is it produced fog. We had a near two hour fog delay on the second day of the tournament. So not only did we already lose a day, but now we're delayed in getting to your morning bite already. And then it was still windy, 15 mile an hour winds, uh, which made a very bumpy ride uh, up to the northwest part of that lake riding with Wyatt. And um, that young man, he could drive that Bascat. We was in the Bascat Puma uh, and we, we, we got our lower lumbar massage, but uh, we got up there, didn't get sprayed too many times, and um, uh, started fishing. But I want to go over, uh, again, uh, some of the complexities that I ran into with the bad weather, not being on the lake in 10 years. And uh, again, you see all of this stuff that I brought with me. Clearly, you can't put all of this in their boat, but let me show you what I did put in their boat. And... Um, how I put myself through more torture. Uh, and then secondly, you can't control a lot of these things, folks. You just can't. You're there as a co-angler. You're there basically as an observer of what they do, where they do it, how they do it, baits techniques, how they're using their tools, such as the grass and electronics, to hopefully learn from the experience at minimal. And to me, that was mission accomplished. I did learn a lot from both of them. And, um, more importantly, I learned more about myself that I made this way too complicated and uh, I learned, I will learn from it and it won't happen again. All right, so some of the lessons learned is gear. Uh, most co-anglers, you should probably carry anywhere five to maybe six rods at the most. Um, depending on your boater, uh, they'd be all right with you bringing a, a few more. Uh, I had eight, but I never took all eight of them at the same time with me. Um, but those eight gave me different techniques that I wanted to try and throw. Um, and, uh, you know, fishing grass, there's so many ways to fish it. Uh, so as an example, you can throw a nice Carolina rig rod down there uh, I had wobble heads tied on uh, various types of swim baits and underspins I even had a Texas rig uh, there and then another bigger underspin and then I had a shaky head worm rod also my Cinco rod uh, and also used it for wacky worms which came uh, in very handy and then I had an Alabama rig rod and then I had two other rods for which I was throwing uh, rattle traps. And this time of the year, Sam Rayburn specifically is known for rattle trap fishing. Uh, so whether you're throwing Cordell hot spots, uh, Arashi shads, uh, the actual rattle trap itself from Bill Lewis lures, it doesn't really matter. Lipless crankbaits in that grass. You chunk it out there, you bring it back, and when you hit the hydrilla, you rip it out, and hopefully they hit it at that time, or sometimes they just hit it out of the blue. Uh, but the grass was all over the lake, and we fished grass uh, for the most part, especially on day two with Brian, uh, in three to five feet of water. We never ventured out deeper than that until the second half of the day. Wyatt, on the other hand, uh, we went straight to a big grass flat that had some submerged stumps in it and he had that trolling motor on high and he was using his forward imaging sonar to look left and right. He was just scanning and when he thought he saw a fish on there, got off the throttle for lack of better words, threw out a crankbait and would stick one. And uh, he had it down to a fine science. So again, hats off to him. I learned a lot from uh, watching that young man uh, work that technique. And when you fishing with somebody like that, as a co-owner, you basically only got one of two choices. Number one is you can just random cast with a rattle trap or whatever out there. Spinner bait, moving bait, chatter bait, swim baits, just moving baits, or 
you can just drag uh, a rig, a Carolina rig, a big jig, um, and you're just fan casting because by the time those baits hit the bottom, uh, it, it's already behind you, right? Uh, so what I did is I broke out the old wobble head and I put uh, a big old bandito bug on the back of it from Guggen Squad. Again, not sponsored by any of those folks. That's three quarters of an ounce that I was dropping. So it hit the bottom real fast. And this is in seven, eight feet of water uh, just so I could pick it up and do it again. Caught one keeper fish doing that and uh, just try my best to keep up with Wyatt. Uh, but I would have to throw literally in the front of the boat. He was doing, throwing directly in the front of the boat. So I went through a little bit on his side. He didn't mind because he told me we were, he was going to fish fast and cover water. Uh, but at the same time, I was not prepared. He was throwing crankbaits that were deep divers and into the little sloughs, for lack of better words. We were literally going on uh, the lines on his uh, hummingbirds for depth. And he had all of his color coded per those contour lines. And we stayed on the contour line the entire time on the shallow flat. And on one side, it would drop down to eight, 10, sometimes 12 feet of water. And then on the shallow side, it was five to seven foot. So we stayed right there on that seven foot line. And he was just scanning left and right. And as soon as he saw it, thinks he saw a fish or some bait, he'd get off the trailer motor and make a cast. And, jerk down to it or just crank down to it and stop the bait right there in front of what he thought and uh, was a bass. First day he weighed in 18 pounds. Second day he had 28. And again, he came in second place on that. Uh, he strongly believes and I support his theory that he could have had more larger fish on the first day. But again, we had that two hour delay. So how did I overcomplicate the first day? Well, number one, uh, I had seven rods with me fishing grass. When I fish grass, I kind of slow and methodically do it. That's not what he had in mind. As I just shared with you, he was scanning and we were ripping down the contour line of this big flat point. Uh, and that's what he did. We moved a couple of other spots. Uh, he did land a fish on an Alabama rig, which again, you got to have a rod dedicated to uh, an Alabama rig. And then this tournament format in the state of Texas, five wires, five blades, three hooks. Uh, so if you're bringing one of those uh, out there to fish that way, again, you gotta have a rod dedicated to it. You're not gonna just sit there and retie and retie for an Alabama rig. I mean, it takes space. I mean, I brought a three wire, three blade, three hook Alabama rig made by Cashin. And again, not sponsored by any of them. And uh, I slung it till my arm fell off, couldn't get bit. But he had a five wire, five blade, three hook, but five baits, two dummies. And uh, he did snag one of his keepers off of it. So I went smaller uh, thinking that I could uh, get just as much action as he would on a five wire. And it just didn't happen for me. But uh, you know, again, hats off to him. He did a fine job, super nice guy, can't complain. But that's the other thing you guys have got to think about. When you're fishing as a co-angler out of somebody else's boat, um, you can bring as much tackle as you want. Uh, but if you're fishing with somebody that's high speed, pedal to the metal, it's hard to keep up with them. Here, I got my two rods. You can see a rattle trap there and the fire tire chatterbait there on those two rods. And you couldn't turn it fast enough uh, to get bit on it. The faster that trap was coming back, it seemed the more aggressive the fish were. And that was also a lesson learned. He had an eight to one uh, gear ratio on his reels. These are six threes to one. And uh, he could bring that bait back uh, that much faster than I could. And uh, he was getting bit, I was not. And to me, uh, it had to be about the speed. He could bring it back you know, 40% faster uh, than what I could uh, making that thing wiggle and uh, having a loud rattle in it. And to me, those were the differences. So that was the lessons learned. Okay, day two, fishing with Brian Robinson. 
Um, he fished more my style, I'll be honest with you. He was slow, uh, methodical, if you want to call it that. Uh, but at the end of the day, he covered a lot of water with the rattle trap uh, and some grass flats on a completely different uh, east side of the lake up near Buck Bay. And uh, he threw rattle traps and threw rattle traps and threw rattle traps. He had seven rods on deck, every one of them with a different size and color manufacturer of a rattle trap and again you know lipless crankbaits um, to get bit and during his pre-fishing he said that this area is where he'd caught you know 12 to 14 pounds and that's all he's really looking for uh, he was just hoping to get 12 14 pounds and me being his co-angler hell I've been happy with 12 14 pounds um, because day one leader was only 11 pounds total for the co-angler side and I had uh, one fish for 1.14 so uh, I knew I had some ground to make up but um, it just didn't happen but what he did again was just throwing rattle traps in, in areas and we rotated back and forth between these two areas that were very close until about noon and uh, I had caught my one keeper bass in there that weighed three three pounds, seven ounces, which was a good chunk. And uh, he was struggling to find keepers on the rattle trap. I'd caught that one fish plus a grinnel yeah, on a wacky worm inside the grass. And uh, as he was getting more and more frustrated and not catching fish on the rattle trap, he started speeding up. And so I had to put down the wacky worm and go to moving baits again. So here I was again, throwing chatter baits, rattle traps, Alabama rig, uh, just to try to keep up with him and then I also had swim baits underspins uh, out there but again that's seven rods that I had to bring with me uh, just to try to keep up with his speed and that's hard to do it's really hard to do you got somebody that's running eight eighty percent on their trolling motor and just whipping and whipping and they're just ripping those crankbaits out of that grass uh, man that was that was challenging. I was not prepared for that. And when you got power poles back there, uh, and they're moving, you know, at three to four miles an hour, uh, believe it or not, you make a thirty-yard cast with a rattle trap because you can really zip them out there. Holy cow! Your your line's behind the, the power poles. So, uh, not to create excuses or anything, but that's just how those guys fish that lake this time of the year. And I just didn't know that. I was not expecting that. I was, uh, again, just wanting to go to an area and just kind of pick it apart. And their definition of picking apart was to throw a rattle trap uh, as fast and as furious as possible. And uh, with me still trying to get over the motorcycle wreck and whatnot, my shoulder just couldn't hold up to that. So I had to rest every once in a while just the same. But again, that's, that's how I learned from both of those guys uh, for that lake is uh, you've got to be prepared this time of the year to Lip, rip through that grass and be prepared for moving baits uh, most of the time and between those two gentlemen we fished water from 12 uh, we squeaked off into 14 feet uh, and then we were in three to five feet and grass was all in that lake and I thought I was prepared but um, yeah they just fished fast I had similar techniques that they were throwing. I would throw a slightly different color or a different size, uh, and then a different technique uh, altogether. In some cases, where I thought I could get away with throwing a smaller, you know, piece of plastic, but at the end of the day, uh, they just fished fast, and I was not prepared to do that mentally. Uh, but again, lesson learned. Okay, another lesson learned is how much crap do you actually try to bring into their boat by rules and definitions they have to give you one of their rear storage compartments uh, to put stuff in and uh, that's not a lot of space especially when you're competing with somebody that has got the whole front deck of their boat rod lockers bait storage they can have 14 rods on deck you bring five, seven, maybe eight rods, and uh, again, different techniques. You're spending a lot of time cutting uh, and changing your rigs uh, where they're just dropping down a rod and picking one up. And by the time 
uh, again, if they're fishing aggressive and fast, they want to give two or three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes tops, different technique or whatever on this area that you just ran to. By the time you re-rig, cut up, uh, and retie, they'll be ready to go to the next spot. Uh, and that's also another one of the challenges, right? Is when you're fishing with somebody that's that fast, that methodical, that has 30 to 40 spots they want to go to and get there, look on their forward facing sonar, see if they see the activity, see if they see balls of bait, you know, whatever it is that they're specifically looking for, brush pile, and uh, you know, as another example, and if they don't see fish down there, up comes the trolling motor and let's go. So you're not even finished re rigging half the time to fish those conditions, those locations. And uh, that's that was a challenge for me as well. So um, how to overcome some of that? Well, again, bring as many rods as you can comfortably be with, with the actions, the length, the type of string uh, that you want or need to fish, various lures and various techniques. Uh, you know, seven foot, medium, heavy, uh, most of the time you should probably bring three, maybe four of those to cover any kind of Texas rig or dragging a jig or big worms down the bottom, spinner baits, chatter baits, uh, and be prepared for that. And then by the time you throw a fifth rod for an Alabama rig in there, a sixth rod for a Carolina rig, you know, that's six rods you got in the boat. And you've only got the little slip to put them in on, on there most of the time on the passenger side. You're, you're spending more time digging rods in and out, changing techniques as you're going from spot to spot than you are fishing. And uh, it can get aggravating and frustrating if you allow it. You mix that up with a swim bait rod, uh, depending on the size of swim baits you use. Uh, again, it can get really complicated very quickly. Uh, so uh, you've got that many rods to put in the boat, plus a lunch bag which I use the Husky from Home Depot as a lunch bag. I'm not sponsored by Home Depot or Husky, but I love this little lunch box. It does what I need to do. I have my chocolate milk, my orange juice in there, and uh, I can do a review of this bag, but you know, for 20 bucks, it's an insulated cooler, slip you an ice pack down in there. It's got water bottle holders here on the side, but I use a, a jug for my water that I stick down here. And this is what I throw in my storage compartment that I'm allowed, along with my paintball mask to protect my face while we're running. Uh, most of these guys, they've only got the driver's console, they don't give you a passenger console, so you're taking all that cold wind, rain, you have to be prepared and all that stuff takes up space. Believe me, going 70 miles an hour in 29 degree weather uh, when it's raining or even just the spray from going through the waves hits you in the face, it hurts, man. It hurts, and uh, it'll sting you, it'll wake you up. And uh, next thing you know, uh, your back sore from all the bumps uh, through the rough water, you're, you're wet and you're cold. You're having a horrible day for the remainder of the day just on the first initial run up the lake. So you have to be prepared. You have to have food, you have to have water, and uh, you know, with the limited space that you've got, that's that's a lot to overcome for a lot of people. And I'm always typically the boater, so I'm used to having all of this space. And for me to downsize uh, for the first time in years was a challenge for me. And we're gonna go over what I downsized to uh, next. Okay, so just a quick overview real quick. Again, you need food. This Arctic, uh, not Arctic, but this Husky, uh, cooler from Home Depot, 20 bucks. It's got insulation here and inside. And so when you put cold drinks in there, this is also insulated. And I kept my Big League Chew in there, uh, along with beef jerky, bag of Skittles, uh, everything else that was uh, small enough to fit in this pocket, I put in there. And again, this held several sticks of beef jerky, chocolate milk, a Mountain Dew. Again, not sponsored by a Mountain Dew in any shape, form, or fashion. Um, an ice pack, plus a bag of Pringles, um, a small can of Pringles, and a small can of almonds, and some trail mix. And then it's got two water bottle here holders on the side, but I use this jug for water. 
This is an Arctic, uh, I believe it's 60 ounces of water, uh, dang near a gallon. And uh, it's got a big opening on it for which, you know, you can put ice in there very easily, stick your whole hand down in there. Instead of the little beady containers, uh, this will allow you to put ice in there, keep it cold all day long, and uh, twist on there, it's all metal. So between this and a thing for food and things you don't want to mix with water, such as your chocolate milk and your orange juice and whatnot, Lunchables uh, I put in here. You actually store a lot of food in here uh, between those pockets up front. And it's even got a pocket back here in the back. Uh, again, not a review of this bag, but just to show you, again, how much food and snacks I can take with me. And uh, my theory is if I'm not catching them, I'll be danged if I go hungry. So. You need to stay hydrated. You need some energy. And uh, this is what I use. I throw this into the dedicated locker box for me in the back of the pro's boat. And that's what I take with me along with a paintball mask, again, to protect my face. Rain gear uh, can also be stored in that box depending on the rain gear that you use. So whether you're using guide wear from Cabela's, 100 mile an hour, Bass Pro Shop, uh, rain suit, uh, Columbia, it doesn't matter. I'm not sponsored by any of those, but there's several great uh, rain suits to protect you from the wind and the rain and keep you warm. You need your gloves, a beanie for your head. Uh, all of that stuff takes space, and when you only get that one little storage compartment uh, to put stuff in, you've got to be very efficient on how you pack all of those items plus your baits. We're going to go over the baits next. Okay. Tackle time, right? Holy cow. Uh, there's several ways to do this. Uh, and again, I think I overcomplicated it uh, way too much. Uh, the first day out with Wyatt, I had this big tackle bag, basically a duffel bag from Cast King. Uh, that's got four pockets around it uh, for which you can stick uh, 3600 series tackle boxes in. I'll pull one of them out here real quick, just so you can see. But you can see there's four of those, and you stick trays, these big tackle boxes in there, and not have a problem. And I had this thing loaded to the gill. And when I mean loaded, I mean loaded. And then you have a nice big opening up top that's divided for which I had things in little zipper bags that were technique specifics and uh, whatnot and just tip that over a little bit you can see that this thing stores a whole bunch of stuff and I still had four tackle trays on the outside plus other trays sitting here with swim jigs and things like that and uh, soft plastics after soft plastics and packages of swim baits and on down the line and I gave myself way too many options uh, not knowing how fast I was going to be fishing but long story short this gave me confidence uh, that way if I did get to an area and I wanted to change color uh, techniques I had it in this bag uh, but at the same time I didn't have it because I did not bring deep diving crankbaits because I was not expecting to do that. I did not even bring square bill crankbaits because I was not expecting to do that neither. And uh, lesson learned. However, other things you've got to bring in your bag is your own culling tags. So if you did catch six keeper bass, you've got a sixth culling tag for which you have to tag your fish in the live wells so you can pull them out and weigh them and lock them with the punctureless uh, tags in the lip and cull your lightest fish. Well, Mo, uh, how are you going to do that? Well, again, this bag has so much space in it. I have my own scale right here in the top and I could just remember which one was my lightest one after I'd weighed them all, and then which one had to go next. There is other uh, Rapala scales, which I got one here in the bird, 
that I use to uh, store one through five. And I just pull out the lightest one. And it's right there and it tells me how much they weigh. Plus, I also have in this bag a first aid kit in case I needed some ibuprofen for which I add in here. I get a hook in my hand, any band-aids, you know, whatever it is. It's always nice because you can't be guaranteed that your boater's gonna have that stuff or be willing to give it to you. Another tool that you gotta be prepared for is the length. I'm yet to admit anybody that's a fisherman that would not let you borrow their bump board. But just in case, uh, if you do run across such a jerk, uh, you should always have a roll up or a retractable uh, ruler that you can lay on the ground, lock it out, and put your fish down there. But I've never seen anybody let, not let you borrow their bump board. But this is what I took with me on day one with Wyatt. As you can see, it's kind of big, it's kind of bulky. It's not gonna fit into a rear storage compartment and uh, you have to put it in the floorboard, which takes up floor space for your feet to go in uh, behind and kind of puts you in an uncomfortable position. But uh, at the end of the day, most of the co-anglers are doing that. The pros are okay with it. As long as you're giving them a clear path to the live well and the driver's console and access to the net, most of them are okay with that. Now, on day two, I took half of this bag out and put it away and I went to a smaller bag this bag is another bag uh, that I can do a review on if you wish to see it but it's really simple and holds not even half of the stuff this is why I brought it with me but you can see I have hard cases in here with all kinds of baits there. Swim bait hooks I had in an individual bag. I had soft plastic swim baits here. And then chatterbait trailers there. And then all kinds of shelled swim baits here standing up in the original casing. Uh, number one, probably could take those out of the original casing and put them into a smaller uh, 3600 tackle box, which is kind of what I did here for all of my Alabama rigs. I got, this is a double sided box. So on this side, I have the paddle tail swim baits. And then here on the other side, I have hooks and the rigs sitting inside there. So when I take one out, uh, I can do what I need to do and, and put a coke ring on there or a soda pop ring and then I have the hooks just laying right there and those are you know 1 8 ounce 3 16 ounce uh, hooks and it all fits right in here and I can change colors and sizes to the ones that I brought and have extras here in case I need a bigger you know uh, size bait and or a different type of bait but again you're only limited in so much space and as you go through the different sizes like these are five inches um, they consume your tackle bag very quickly which is why I had that big bag I also had big jigs in here as well and this bag also had two 3600 sitting in here and this right here is another lesson learned that I have this whole 3600 chalk full of rattle traps, different sizes, different brands, different colors, etc., etc. Look at all those rattle traps in there. I only threw two different ones. So, could I have taken some of this out and put hard jerk baits in here and combined with the rattle traps? Absolutely. Uh, and then I would not have needed that big duffel bag uh, before. So again, I, I couldn't have consolidated hard baits into smaller amounts you know put four or five of each color and call it done but instead i overcomplicated. i put 40 rattle traps in here for some stupid reason and i uh, thought i was going to throw them and need them all uh, because again i didn't know the color of water that we was going into and this other hard box is literally a hard box full of jerk baits and two or three little square bills in there but look at all that 
I could have fit what I used into one really consolidated and uh, saved some space, but again, I overcomplicated things. This bag also has these side pockets that Velcro close and open and just tons and tons of plastic baits, Cinco's, worms uh, on that side. And then on this side over here, I have more worms and more worms and more shaky head uh, uh, baits, uh, more worms, centipedes, fluke, a couple of different colors of flukes, a couple of different colors of worms again, more worms and more worms. And uh, you know, again, that's a lot of plastic worms, plastic flukes, brush hogs uh, that comes out of the side of that. And then up here, I had heavy jigs in case I was going to go out dragging in again. Uh, three quarter ounce to one ounce, three different colors, black and blue, a green pumpkin, and a watermelon color jig because you never know what color of water you're going to be throwing. And then here on the side, in this pocket over here, extra string for a Carolina rig leader. And then down inside here is where I had my terminal tackle box right there. For most of my weights, wobble heads and shaky heads, fits right in here. It's a double stack, and this bag held it beautifully, just like that. And there's room to spare in there. And then over here, you get all this stuff out of the way. Look at all that. It zips down and gives you another little pocket inside to store tools, dip and dies, you know, whatever you want to put in there. And uh, I, again, I had more hooks, shaky heads, dip and dies, uh, dip and die markers, wacky tools, and all that other fun stuff. And then the other consolidation that I had done uh, for this bag was I consolidated all my chatter baits and spinner baits into Ziploc bags. You don't have to worry about the colors bleeding over on these types of baits uh, because, again, they're not soft plastics. There's skirts with blades. There's 30 spinner baits right there. Didn't use them all. Only used one. Uh, so could I have dumbed it down even more? Possibly. Uh, but that's, again, all the stuff that I took the second day with this bag, along with an extra pair of sunglasses in case mine blew off while running, uh, in a hard case. That way if I stepped on them, they wouldn't crush or anything. But always have a second uh, thing of sunglasses. So with all that being said, uh, again, lessons learned, right? What do you need to pack? As you can see, you can throw a lot of stuff in a little tackle bag, uh, needless to say, and you can take a lot of rods and consume a lot of space real quick. But you gotta have food and water, you have to bring your own, you have to bring your life jacket, and you gotta stay warm. January, you just don't know what the weather's gonna throw at you, my friends. And uh, we got thrown uh, a very severe cold front and uh, it was it was tough and then you know we had to adjust so I take all of this stuff with me in the RV when we're traveling but even then you got to bring it down into a small bag and uh, shoot for the stars so again hats off to MLF for keeping us safe and canceling on the first day being out there 40 mile an hour northwest winds was not going to be fun and um, I'm glad they did that to keep us safe. Hats off to Wyatt Ferguson and Brian Robinson uh, for taking me fishing, showing me a few of their stuff, the spots, uh, their techniques most importantly and how they're using their tools, the forward imaging sonar and all that other good stuff. Uh, man, that was a quite a show, uh, especially with Wyatt uh, getting second place overall for the tournament. So hats off to that young man. Hope this video helps you out on how to prepare as a co-angler for any tournament, uh, not just MLF. But uh, being a co-angler, again, is an adjustment for me for this year. I am going to be fishing uh, a lot, finally, now that I'm able to do such. And uh, we'll do a video every time. So thanks for watching. Hope this helps you out. Y'all be safe out there. Go rip some lip.